Well, hi, welcome to the podcast. I'm Mark Graben. We're joined today by Dr. John Toussaint. He's the founder and chairman of the board of Catalysis, a nonprofit um, organization uh, based out of Wisconsin and other other locales. So, uh, John, thanks for joining us. How are you? Very good. Glad to be here, Mark. And speaking of Wisconsin, it's it's summertime. You're up there enjoying some nice weather, I, I presume. Yeah, the weather's spectacular. It's I love Wisconsin in the summer and, and fall, and uh, so it's you know, seventy five, dry, sunny today. Yeah, well, good. Well, so you know, given gosh, given the pandemic, you're you're not traveling. I'm not traveling, but you're you're still talking to a lot of healthcare organizations. So I was wondering if we could explore. You know what? What what's happening? What what are some of the challenges? What are some of the um, organizations that are, are coping better with you know this this time of change and uncertainty? So you know, here's a first question. You know, as much as you can generalize, you know, healthcare organizations who have experience with lean or you know they've they've been building a culture of continuous improvement. Do you have any examples of how those organizations have fared better during these times? Yeah, it's amazing how important the lean thinking has been in organizations that have been at this for a while in terms of their ability to manage this crisis. And uh, we've heard it from many different organizations that the standardized management system that, they, that they've that they been working on over the years has, has really gotten them through this mess uh, We've written a couple of papers on this, one for Harvard Business Review, in which we we highlighted the work that was done at Morningside Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, uh, you know, when the, when it was really at the peak of the crisis. Uh, they were able to use their daily huddle system to really bubble up a lot of great ideas from staff members in terms of what do we need to do right now? And uh, th th there were thousands of ideas that were implemented immediately at the front line to deal with issues that, you know, would have taken weeks if it had gone through the typical bureaucratic layers, you know? So, and, and, and because of that, they were able to keep their, their staff members much more safe. They had very few infections. Plus they were able to improve flow uh, through the emergency room they added 60 beds, uh, ICU beds in 10 days by some uh, basically, you know, simple uh, reconfigurations that were based on staff ideas. That's one example. I think the, the work at uh, UMass Memorial with Eric Dixon's team, another great example of, of really managing through this crisis using the the lean management system as the way to really identify and solve problems every day. I mean, again, thousands and thousands of staff ideas being implemented at, at UMass Memorial, uh, Kansas City uh, Children's uh, uh, Children's Kansas City uh, Children's Mercy. Uh, they had uh, uh, really taken their whole huddle system and and. In, in many ways, changed it into a virtual huddle system that actually got more people engaged and involved and bubbled up problems and barriers on safety issues during the COVID crisis. I mean, I could go on and on and on. The point being that it's really important, especially when you have so much chaos, to have a system that allows you to really focus in on what's most important. And I think uh, the, the, the organizations that that have, have been at this and, and really have built that system have, have fared much better. And I've, I've talked to a couple of organizations that, um, you know, where their leaders say the same thing, that the work, the heavy lifting and the work they had put in in 2019 and previous years really ended up paying off uh, in 2020. Um, you know, a, a, lean, a, a lean management system isn't something that gets installed um, in a couple of days as the chaos is occurring. Hopefully it's there as a foundation. Um, so, I mean, what, what are your thoughts if, you know, an organization, let's say now we know there are organizations that really don't yet follow that sort of leadership approach. Um, you know, things have calmed down a little bit for an organization. Would you, how would you make the case that, you know, now is as good a time as any, if they didn't do it a couple of years ago, you know, that would have been, you know, it would have been better if they had, but, you know, what's the argument for starting today? 
Well, I think, you know, we've been publishing podcasts from the, these leaders that have been doing this. And I, what I would do is, is go back and look at those podcasts, uh, Lucy Xenophone's podcast. We did, did ones with Cleveland Clinic and uh, we've done them with um, uh, Torrance Memorial out in Los Angeles. We did, did one with uh, Children's Mercy and, and, and several others. And uh, the work at uh, Christie Clinic uh, in Illinois. I mean, so I, I would go back and 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 listen to those podcasts. They're very simple, 15, 20 minutes of of these leaders that have really shown that that that, that, that this system is better than 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 you know any other system. And uh, use that as kind of the material, the fodder to get people, the leaders engaged and interested in, in making some changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the evidence is out there, I think, uh, both in the literature and the, and the, um, the podcast and other things that suggest that this is the right thing to do. So let's get started. I mean, it's not, it's like you say, this isn't a light switch and then all of a sudden it's great. I mean, you got to start somewhere. We always suggest you start with the one or two departments and begin to build that standard work for the management system that really supports those staff ideas and supports the staff and you uh, spread it from there. So it's, it's, it's time to get started and there's plenty of materials, uh, you know, both on your website and our website uh, to, to get started with. Yeah, and I, I would certainly recommend um, the podcast. Um, it's called The Lens. Um, so if people want to go search podcast directory for Catalysis Lens, I bet, I bet you'll find it. It's definitely worth um, seeking out. And you mentioned the HBR article. I'll, I'll make sure that there's links and everything in the show notes about how to, uh, how to find um, these, these resources um, that, that you're putting out, you and the team are putting out at Catalysis. But I want to step back and, and, and talk about UMass Memorial because I had an opportunity to interview their CEO, our mutual friend, Dr. Eric Dixon. And um, I'll, I'll give a shout out to a different podcast. I interviewed him for the Habitual Excellence podcast that, that I'm doing for uh, Value Capture. And, and John, thank you again for having been a guest on that podcast. But, you know, Eric and I talked about a number of things, you know, the he talked about the power of engaging everybody in continuous improvement. They've been doing this for years. Um, he also talked about the thought process around committing to no layoffs and no furloughs during this time. You know, I saw a headline this morning, uh, a list of hospitals that are bringing people back from furloughs, thankfully. But you know, I think it's really interesting. Um, you know, I, I admire the stance that, that Eric took. He was able to convince his board that it was better to invest in their people. So I'm, I'm curious, what, what are your thoughts? Or you've probably talked to Eric about the same topic, um, you know, this idea of in, investing in training and continuous improvement instead of um, taking the short-term benefit of furloughs. Well, I think that what Eric, the, he's, he's living, he, he's modeling the way, frankly, in my opinion, for the less, rest of leaders in healthcare. And, the way he's doing that is very much Paul O'Neill like, you know, I mean, respect for people. So the ultimate respect for people is you don't furlough them. You don't lay them off during the tough times. You, you build the, the capability of those people to do work even better. And, and, and so investing in those people is, is the, is the right thing to do. I mean, I love what Torrance Memorial leaders did where they, they basically took 500 people and put them into a special pool uh, in which they made PPE, you know? I mean, it's like, that's awesome. I mean, they made 5,000 face shields and they made, uh, you know, they created a, a disinfectant wipes. And, and then they also were redeployed to check people in, in terms of temperature and, and whether or not they had any COVID symptoms. So, I mean, and those people were excited to continue to, to be able to help in this time, right? So if, it, if you weren't an ICU nurse, you, you worked in the GI lab, but, but 
that GI lab nurse could actually do something that was helping her colleague in the in the in the ICU. That's what it means to do work that gives your life meaning. And I think you know that's the fundamental concept here is that what Eric has done and, and what the folks at Torrance Memorial and other places have done is listen, we really respect you. We want you to be part of this team. We're gonna we're gonna help build some capability during this time. Maybe we don't have the GI lab open, but you know, we we still need you to do some very important work. And and to me, that's the ultimate living of the principle of respect for people. And I think Eric is uh, is a great example of that that we all can learn from. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I love how Eric, um, you know, he framed it as a choice and he said he had to sell his board on that choice. And I compare that to organizations that put out statements and say things like, oh, uh, we had no choice but to furlough people or we were forced to lay off people. And I always find that kind of curious because that seems to sort of, you know, absolve the leaders of responsibility for a decision or a choice that they're making. So it's kind of interesting. It's just to see the different mindset where I think, you know, going back to Toyota, times of challenge and tribulation and, and, and financial need um, can spur creativity. I mean, that, that ultimately seems to be the root of the, the Toyota production system. So hearing what they did in Torrance, you know, sort of, um, right. De dedicating people to that challenge instead of just backing off and laying them off. That's great to hear. Necessity is the mother of invention. And if you if you tie that to principles, and I think that's the problem with, with a lot of leadership today is, is, you know, we didn't have any choice. Well, if you had some principles behind your choices, like Eric does and like Torrance Memorial leaders do and like you know, Paul O'Neill did, yeah, like Paul O'Neill did, like many other organizations that you and I have have uh, encountered trying to learn this methodology. The principles really drive the choices, and uh, then you do have a choice, and it's based on the bedrock of of your management philosophy. And and unfortunately, there's not a lot of bedrock in in some organizations. Hmm. And. You know, I think, you know, how Eric framed, you know, the idea of investing in your people versus furloughing them or laying them off and then having to rehire later. You know, I think of the flip side, a um, friend of a friend, he was an acquaintance, I don't know him well, but he's a specialist at a children's hospital. Um, he was furloughed. And like, you know, to our mutual friend and to others, that, that's surprising because like, well, how, how, you know, uh, he's a highly skilled, highly trained professional that you think the organization would view him as more of a partner than a cost to be cut. And so a, as a result, this physician is actively looking for jobs in other organizations, even though he's been brought off furlough, I think that trust and that relationship um, was damaged to the point where hopefully he can find himself maybe, well, he, he's a children's hospital specialist, so maybe not at UMass Memorial, but maybe he can end up someplace where there's a lean management philosophy in place and, Next time there's hard times, they'll, they'll commit to him. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot more of this thinking throughout the healthcare industry today than there was, you know, a decade ago. Mm -hmm. So I, my guess is he will. And, and there's some really great children's hospitals that have been, you know, applying these principles now. So I, I'm optimistic he'll be able to find a place that actually respects him mm -hmm. and uh, will treat him differently than where he's been. Yeah, no, I sure hope so. Um, so one of the things we want to talk about today, talking about necessity being the mother of invention, um, the world has changed in many ways, including kind of the, um, you know, re related to the conferences, right? So I've always, I've said for, I think, you know, the 10 years that it's taken place that, uh, the lean healthcare transformation summit that catalysis puts on is absolutely one of my favorite events each year. And, you know, it, it was, you know, the, the difficult decision um, to cancel, well, understandable decision to cancel that this year. Um, so I was wondering, if, you know, if you could share some thoughts about that and what you and Catalysis are doing to sort of, you know, try to do something different here um, since the, 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 the typical conference wasn't able to happen. One of the things that we've decided is that this, you know, our, our motto is learn, share, and connect. So 
in this time where we can't have conferences, how do we learn, share, and connect? And I think that, you know, every week now we have some something that's being uh, sent out through our channels, uh, either a podcast, a webinar, a blog, an article. And these are all based on real work that teams from throughout the world are doing that are that are applying lean thinking to their work. And so we've really kind of pivoted to say, let's do something, you know, every day or every week and, and, and highlight the work of many organizations that are applying these principles. And we've gotten a lot of really positive feedback, you know, whether it's the management system work or, uh, you know, sharing data and information across the system or how do you how do you actually uh, examine a patient in a car? So they don't have to sit in a waiting room. I mean, yeah. it's some really cool innovations that have happened throughout the, you know, the Catalysis Healthcare Value Network organizations. And so what we decided to do is just share as much as we can share. And again, it's we're 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 dependent on the organization's willingness to share. But what we found is that a lot of people want, uh, are willing and and actually want to share what they've learned because they have done some tremendous innovation. And so that's kind of the way that we've decided to deal with this is let's do real time sharing of great innovative work in healthcare organizations that are applying lean thinking. And so, so we have, you know, all these podcasts, all these articles, all this stuff coming out every week and, and you can go and, 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 you know, pick your, pick your topic and go, see what some pretty amazing work has been done, whether it's, you know, uh, examining patients in cars or, you know, or, or, or adding 60 ICU beds in 10 days. I mean, it's, it's, so that's what we decided, Mark, is we just, we want to share as much as we can, as fast as we can through the crisis so that people can learn and, and take some of those ideas and, 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 and innovate themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in a way it's more like uh, continuous flow, sharing or you know small batch learning sharing and and connecting in different ways i i think that uh you know this the whole conference situation i i, I just don't know what's going to happen with all of that you know i mean when can we gather together again with six or seven hundred people i mean is that ever going to happen i mean i hope so but uh, you know it's it's really questionable so in the meantime, I think we on the education side of things have to really innovate ourselves. We have to be constantly trying new things. I mean, today we're doing this rather than a, a, just over voice. We're doing it with video. Okay, well, we haven't done that before. So great. Let's try that. You know, I mean, let's keep trying things. That's what we're going to have to do. There is a specific virtual event coming up on October 21st. I'll, I'll make sure. Uh, we get a link to that in the show notes, the, the Catalysis Virtual Summit 2020. Um, it's, uh, well, it says invitation only event actually on the website, but is it possible for, for someone to get an invitation? I think if someone's interested in, 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 um, in it, then they, they can contact us and we'll, we will, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get back to them. Okay. Uh, you know, so, so John, you know, you raise the important, one of the important questions of the day of, you know, when is it going to be safe for people to gather again? Um, you know, there, there's so much, I think that has evolved in terms of our understanding of COVID-19 um, over the past months. And it seems like there's new information coming out every day. So I guess my, my, my question uh, for for you um, as a physician, maybe has two parts. Like for one, how do you keep up with information and and keep informed? And what would you recommend to the general public? Um, you know, we don't have medical training and education. Um, what are the best ways for people to find you know, let's say, reputable information as opposed to whatever's just floating around? Well, that's a that's a good question. I, I can tell you what I do. It's not necessarily going to be what everybody can do, 
But what I try to do is base my understanding of things on, on science. And so I'm looking for specific articles that either confirm or don't confirm what the, you know, the issue of the day is related to this. So there are two, there are two journals that I tend to rely on. Uh, I rely on the New England Journal and I rely on Health Affairs. Uh, those are two journals that publish a lot and have published a lot recently on, on this, on this uh, virus. I think that, you know, there certainly are other reputable publications. I mean, I think Becker's Hospital Review is, 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 does a pretty good job. Uh, I think there's certainly others. And um, I think it just depends on, you know, what your level of willingness to dig into this stuff is. Mm -hmm. My willingness is pretty intense. So I'm going to try to use the science. I think the work that was published by the uh, CEO of Kinexis is, 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 is accurate. Mm -hmm. oh. And, um, you know, he's, he's done a lot of uh, work on trying to understand this virus and in, in ways that, uh, you know, that he was able to predict where things were going to go. The whole mask issue. I mean, from, from, from the beginning, uh, he, he really, you know, said we got to wear masks and that's when the CDC was saying we don't have to. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's, there are different sources and you have to choose them, but I, I tend to rely, I like to rely on the, the science the best we can, even though the science isn't great at the moment. Uh, but we're going to see more and more good science, I think, come out of this. Yeah, well, thank, thanks for mentioning um, Greg's emails, and, and those are archived. Um, he, he's still putting those out um, on the Kinexus website, so I'll link to that in the show notes. So thank you for mentioning what Greg, ja what Greg Jacobson is, um, is doing. And um, one other thing I'll, I'll go ahead and mention here for um, the listeners and, and the viewers is that um, John here is going to be part of a panel or actually part of a, first off, a, a webinar um, that John's gonna be presenting um, with Kim Barnes, who's also from Catalysis, a webinar on August 19th, Becoming the Change, Leadership Behavior Strategies for Continuous Improvement in Healthcare. Um, so you can register for that today. I'll put a link again in the show notes, or you can go to kinexus.com slash webinars. Um, so, so maybe while we're on that thought, John, is all right, maybe we, we can give a bit of a preview of, of that webinar. And this is also giving a bit of a preview for your upcoming book. So we're kind of teasing something that's helping tease something else. Um, can, can you talk, you know, for one, um, the importance of becoming the change? Like, for example, you, you mentioned Eric Dixon as an example of a leader who's leading by, an ex leading by example. So why is it important for leaders um, to become the change? Well, I think, People look to their leaders to determine what's important and and really how they should act and behave and and when you model the way like Eric or Mr. Dubay in South Africa or many of the other uh, leaders that we highlight in this book, then the culture begins to change and you know culture is all about behaviors. So if you model the behaviors that you want in your organization, uh, the organization will become the change. And that starts with the individual leader. So the, what we're going to talk about on the 19th is uh, one of the chapters in the book where we actually introduce a way to begin to think about how you might change. And we talk about the personal A3. We talk about how you actually do a, a self-rating so that you can, I mean, our, our, our own best and worst critics are ourselves. So if we have a self-reflection mechanism by which we can sit down every week or so and say, you know, what, 
what did I do this week that unleashed the creativity of my team? Or what did I do this week that shut everybody down? And if you can self-reflect on that, those types of questions, it will help you realize, you know, where you want to spend some time in terms of, of improvement. And so this is really about improving our leadership capability and doing that through how we act and behave. And that's really the whole tenor of the book is what did these leaders do differently that actually led to major changes in their own, in their organizations? And so as, as they become the change, the organization changes to uh, to an improvement culture, mm-hmm. and that and that's what that's what we're going to focus on on the nineteenth. Yeah. So um, reflection and problem solving and other leadership behaviors um, will be um, a big part of what you explore in uh, in that webinar. So I'm looking looking forward to that and encourage people um, to go register for that. And then um, maybe if you can just talk um, briefly a little a little bit more about the book. Um, I, I know we're going to have an opportunity to do a podcast together with you and Kim um, hear about the book. So I don't want to totally steal the thunder of, of that episode, but if maybe if you can give just a little bit more of a quick preview, even just in terms of when the book is going to be available, and then we'll dig into it deeper uh, next time. The book's going to be available September 1st, and um, we are, we, we've really divided it into different sections. So there's, there's a section on, okay, what, what did leaders do that really made a difference in their organizational culture and performance? So what did they do? Then we're going to have, we have a section on, well, so how do you actually do it with very specific uh, tools and ideas about how you make these changes happen? And then we have a section on what's the future look like? What's the future of lean thinking? What's the future of innovation in healthcare look like? And so that's how the book is 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 designed. Uh, and I think the feedback we've gotten so far is is that people are happy that we actually have a how to part of the book because yeah. most of our books in the past have been, well, here's we're going to lay this out. You know, here's what people did, and good luck. This book is actually, here's what people did, and here's how you could actually go do it right now. And you'll be able to link to uh, parts of our website to download different types of templates and and uh, learning materials so that you can actually do what we talk about in the book. So I think um, the last thing we want to explore today, John, is, uh, you know, I don't see a crystal ball on your bookshelf, but we talk about um, the future of um, healthcare, how does this COVID pandemic, in your um, estimation, change the trajectory of, of what we expect to happen? I think there's a lot of things that have changed and are going to continue to change. And the first thing I would say is that the financing system has actually changed during this crisis, which is, I think one of the key drivers for innovation in in healthcare delivery. So when CMS determined that you're going to get paid as much for a virtual visit as you were for a face-to-face visit, that really changed things. And then the commercial insurers followed suit very quickly thereafter. CMS also changed some of the ACO um, payments uh, in terms of the downside and upside risk payments related to uh, the virus and whether those are maintained or not, we'll see. But I think what it's done is it's made the payers start thinking about population health, which we've been talking about for a decade or more, but we never have gotten to in terms of incentives. And now I think this crisis has really kind of driven us to the payers, and of course the major payer, which is Medicare, uh, to be thinking about the world a lot differently. And so I think we're gonna start to see different types of contracts uh, related to this population health work that 
we've talked a lot about and a few people have done, but it has not taken over the industry, which we need desperately for it to do in terms of the financing mechanism so that we can really start innovating, get people out of hospitals, start thinking about, you know, health, health outcomes rather than just sickness care. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And I think what, because of that, I think what we're going to see now is more innovation in healthcare. And I think what we're talking about when we're talking about innovation is care model innovation. So what we want is new care models. We don't want the same old, same old. That's what I loved about what the Christie Clinic did. They examined the patients in the car so they didn't even have to come into the office. I mean, that's that's cool, yeah. right? So what other kinds of these crazy things can we do? I mean, Atreus, you know, Health in Boston has, has done the medically uh, at home uh, piece. And so they're, you know, maybe 25% of patients that went into the hospital are being cared for at home now. I mean, these are the kinds of things that we need to, to, to develop. The problem in traditional healthcare delivery, though, is we don't have any systems to do that. We don't have new product development system. And so we're going to have to, we're going to have to figure out how to do this. We're going to have to figure out how to build new care models. And because we don't have the expertise to do it and we don't have the wherewithal to do it really. And so I think that is going to be kind of the next frontier here. Uh, you know, lean product process development work has been going on for a long time in, in other industries. It hasn't gone on at all or very little in our, in our industry in healthcare. So, we're going to see that, and I think the financing mechanism is going to start to support that, and it already has through the crisis. And I, so I think I'm pretty excited about all that. I think this is going to be, you know, new frontiers and traditional old heads and beds in the hospital. Finally, finally, maybe we're going to start to move away from that. Yeah, and and back to the idea of um, necessity being the mother of invention. Um, I, I've heard of instances where changes to, let's say, clinic care driven by short-term needs and pressures um, or maybe turn into longer-term innovations. So looking at more uh, telemedicine, video visits, that's still a payment. There, there's some temporary, you know more about this than, than, than I do, of course, but there, there's payment dynamics, um, temporary changes that have not yet been made permanent. Is that, is that the case? Well, I, I think that the temporary changes, I think CMS has pretty much now said that's what's going to happen. And, and I, was, I was just talking to a former CEO of a large uh, Blue Cross plan, and uh, he now works for another large insurance company. And he said, that's, that's the way we're going. So I think, <clears throat> I think the payment changes that have changed at this point are probably going to be are going to be maintained, and my guess is that we're going to see more. That we're going to see more more focus on on actual pay for health outcomes, population health management, uh, disease management, uh, other things that that we just traditionally have never gotten paid to do. And that's what I'm hoping because I, I do think that that then becomes the mother of an of um, you know the, the necessity is the mother of innovation or invention. I think that. We've just had a terribly um, barrier-filled set of incentives. And as those start to get broken down, I think we're going to need to learn how to do true in innovation. And, um, and I think that's going to be kind of the next frontier. How do we take our you know, our method of, of lean thinking and add that core element to it, which every organization that practices lean thinking has, except healthcare delivery. <laughs> and so healthcare delivery is going to have to catch up again uh, with the rest of the universe. <laughs> well, thank you for your efforts to continue uh, pushing uh, in that positive direction. And as, as you said earlier, uh, learning, sharing, and connecting. So thank you, 
John, for um, all that you continue to do and, and the things that Catalysis does. So again, um, just off the top of my head, I'll encourage people to go check out the podcast, uh, The Lens from Catalysis. Um, we've got the webinar coming up through Kinexus on August 19th. Um, and that webinar shares the title of um, the upcoming book by John and by Kim Barnes, Becoming the Change, Leadership Behavior Strategies for Continuous Improvement in Healthcare. So again, links will be in the show notes. I hope everybody checks that all out. And um, John, look forward. Thank you for being here today and look forward to being able to do this uh, again sometime soon. Sounds great, Mark. Thanks. And thanks for everything you do, too. It's uh, You're sharing a lot of great information, so we appreciate that. I'm also trying to learn, share, and connect. So, Good. Thanks, John. Cheers. Cheers.